Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Income inequality is finally getting its due in the political spotlight. We've got Pope Francis redefining what it means to be Pope and sneaking out of the Vatican at night to minister to the homeless and declaring that to not share your wealth is a form of theft. We have President Obama saying that income inequality and a lack of economic mobility is the defining issue of our time and of his presidency. And most importantly, we have people taking to the streets. On Thursday, demonstrations were held at fast food restaurants in cities across the country, more than 100 cities, according to organizers. Protesters demanded higher wages for employees at McDonald's, Burger King, and their competitors. The demand for a higher minimum wage is one supported by the president. We know that there are airport workers and fast food workers and nurse assistants and retail salespeople who work their tails off and are still living at or barely above poverty. And that's why it's well past the time to raise a minimum wage that in real terms right now is below where it was when Harry Truman was in office. This is all against a backdrop where even good news about the country's economic recovery is always tempered. Take Friday's job report. 203,000 jobs created in November and an unemployment rate that fell to 7%, the lowest level in five years. That's good news. But the percentage of working age Americans participating in the labor force has remained practically static and has even dropped a little in the past year. That means too many of the people who have given up on finding a job are still not seeing any reason to get back in the game. And many of the jobs that have been created since the recession, most according to an August 2012 report of the National Employment Law Center, have been low wage jobs. Now, even as we debate raising the minimum wage, Congress is on the verge of letting long term unemployment insurance expire, which would suddenly end benefits for 1.3 million people, oh right, just after Christmas. Mm -hmm. At the table, Mark Morial, president and CEO of the National Urban League and former mayor of New Orleans. Amy Goodman, host and executive producer of Democracy Now! Joel Berg, the executive director of the New York City Coalition Against Hunger, and Ovik Roy, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Amy, why is $15 an hour so important? Uh, well, first they were chanting on the streets before the sun even rose on Thursday in Times Square. Uh, we can't survive on 725, right, the federal mm. minimum wage. I was talking to a woman named Elba who walked out of McDonald's. She worked there for six years. She makes 750. She got one raise in six years. She can't support her child on this. And then we played on Democracy Now! Um, a recording that Nancy Salgado, a woman who works at McDonald's in Chicago, made when she called the McDonald's Mick Resources line because she said, I, I can't make it. And they said, have you heard about the federal program? There's a federal program that goes along with your salary, right, called SNAP. <laughs> wow. And she said, oh, and then could I take my kids to the doctor on that? They said, oh, there's another program. It's called Medicaid. And this goes to the issue of conservatives and liberals. When you say, well, you just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and get another job and get another job. The fact is that... There isn't an outcry by conservatives, or I think some there is, when the very CEOs of these very corporations are being tax subsidized. And let me give you an example, because this is an amazing study that came out from Sarah Anderson at the Institute for Policy Studies called Fast Food CEOs Rake in Taxpayer Subsidized Pay. So use the example of Yum! Brands. They own KFC, they own Pizza Hut, um, they own Taco Bell. They paid CEO David Novak $94 million in fully deductible so-called performance pay. That's mm -hmm. outside of the salary over the years 2011-12. That works out to a $33 million taxpayer subsidy to Yum just for one executive's pay, $33 million. So we are subsidizing workers at these low-paying corporations um, because they have to get welfare, they have to get staff, they have to get Medicaid. And then we subsidize these massive CEO pays because they get these loopholes like performance pay. One of the things that's interesting to me is that I was in Seattle and I think last week there were two news reports, one in Seattle where the mm -hmm. Seattle City Council is considering its own $15 an hour minimum wage, Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, you have local ordinances now, and you've got a number of states that have created minimum wages higher than the federal minimum wage. Yep. That's a response to federal inaction. Yes. The best approach, the best way, is for Congress to set a reasonable minimum wage and tie it to inflation. We have local governments and state governments taking matters into their own hands because this is a problem. They're hearing it from their constituents. They're hearing it uh, from people across the nation. Look. In New Jersey, the voters, the voters passed a higher 
subminimum wage, put it in the state constitution, mm -hmm. which is remarkable in the sense that it's a response to federal inaction. Yep. So, at, you, at the same time that they're, that they're electing Chris Christie, right? So this is indicative of, of this possibility that some sense of economic justice might, in fact, transcend sort of the, our most narrow partisan ba battles. And it, it does feel to me like part of the argument that Amy made, Joel, is if you legitimately want to shrink the social safety net, right? So if, if you're not a bad person and you want the people to go hungry, you just say, hey, look, I think there's too many people on these various government programs. It does does seem like the most standard basic way to do that is to make wages living wages in which people can purchase their own food and housing. Oh, absolutely. And if you look at the polls, even the majority of Republicans in America support raising the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And I say to conservatives, if you're against government spending, then you should be for higher minimum wages. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a penny of government spending to say we're finally going to reward work. And I spoke at a campus recently and a student was insistent. He learned in class that raising the minimum wage will kill jobs. And I said it's been done dozens of times. It's never happened. If you had a professor who told you that turning water down to zero degrees will never make it freeze, and you turned it down to zero degrees 32 times and it froze every time, maybe the theory's wrong. And let's look at the facts. Minimum wage creates jobs because it gives more people more purchasing power. Mm -hmm. and, and people who are at the margins who are going to go spend that money right away. Yeah, on wasteful things like food and clothing. <laughs> so, Ovik, you made a, a point earlier that I thought that I want to return to on this exactly this question, which is there, there's a set of conservative intellectuals and think tank folks, there's people running for office, and there's a base, right? So talk to me about the politics of what it means to be a conservative lawmaker running against the minimum wage, running against, poor, like, what, what's the political calculus that says it makes perfect sense for me to run against an increase in the minimum wage, to run on a you know slashing of food stamps. What are the political realities on the ground that are making conservative lawmakers think that makes sense? Yeah, so there's, there's shall we say, two sets of, of, of issues. So the issues where there might be tension between the base and the intellectuals, and those are things like prioritizing equality of opportunity, really focusing on things like education reform, all that sort of thing. When it comes to the minimum wage, there isn't tension between the base and the intellectuals mm -hmm. because there is a consensus in the conservative world that the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage is economically destructive. Based because, on what? Because, well, I'll get to that. Okay. Uh, so so to, your, to your argument, Amy, about how well there are these CEOs making all this money and that's why people have low wages. Well, no, no, of course, these are, the these are franchises. The taxpayers subsidize. Right, it's but, one thing the, if they're paying the, the, their the, fair taxes, but these but corporations. But these are, a $33 million taxpayer right, subsidy but, but the, for the head of but Young? But the CEO does not pay the wages of the, the worker at your local McDonald's. That's a franchise that's owned by a franchise owner, and that person is paying the wages. Why should this and so if get you get a 33 million so you, dollar so just, tax just rebate. Just let me try to explain how this works. So if you double the wages of a person who works at that McDonald's, then if that person, if that franchise owner doesn't have bags of money hiding behind the potato fryer, then he has to do one of two things. He has to hire less people or he has to raise prices for consumers but, but, okay, and but have that's, to increase but that's, costs that, down. But that franchise argument, which, which I actually, like, I respect the franchise argument in the sense of for actual franchise owners, they are facing some real constraints. But that's precisely why the corporations set the process up in this way. I mean, it's not sort of, it's not as though in order to run a McDonald's or a fast food corporation, you would necessarily have to franchise in this way. This is precisely developed so that it is the front line sort of small business owner, you know, McDonald's owners, operators who have to take the hit. Why not, in fact, force a new situation where the corporations at the top who are getting these enormous tax subsidies in mul at multiple levels have to pay their workers a fair wage? Because the result would be higher costs and less hiring. What you, if you really, if you're addressing, if you want hiring? to address, if you want to address income inequality, the way to do it is not to make it more expensive for companies to hire people, it's to actually have a direct transfer through things like the Earned Income Tax so Credit. I want to respond to that because I think the more important point, and you sort of made this point, and that is, and I'm trained in economics, so economic theory versus mm -hmm. economic practice mm -hmm. and economic history. So the history of the minimum wage, particularly in these types of times, demonstrates that when you raise it, the people who are the beneficiaries will spend it back in the economy yep. and it has a demand stimulative effect. That offsets, mm -hmm. uh, offsets, if you will, the negative side of simply raising 
the wages across the board. That the is, other that point is that the money is idle before the, the it's other, given the to other the other point workers. is 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 and this is really a critical point, and that is that the safety net system, whether it's CHIP, Medicaid, uh, whether it is the Earned Income Tax Credit Program, across the line are subsidizing low wage jobs because a large portion, mm -hmm. maybe 40 to 50 percent of low wage, we're talking about working people, many of them women, are also, their families participate in these safety net programs yep. because they don't make enough money to sort of be ineligible for the program. So if you're talking about economic self-sufficiency, yep. so we've got to understand this in the context of pragmatism, mm -hmm. the under reality and history, and too much of this debate is dominated by theoretical and ideological conversations. In fact, speaking of the ideological, when we come back, I want to talk about